Good morning. It's Wednesday, July 23rd, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 31. And my name is Chris, and we have such a fun episode planned today. I'm out at OSCON, but never fear. A great episode, a look back at something we all can relate to. It's not a Mac thing, it's not a PC thing, it's not a Linux thing, it's not a smartphone thing. It's that internet thing. And in today's episode, we'll look back at sort of the genesis of the internet up to um, the bad old days of the 90s, because I think most of you probably have it from there. But it all really started with a government project, and we're going to get into that and look at, I want, in case perhaps some of our audience is either a little younger and they haven't seen this stuff, or if you're like me and you just get extremely nostalgic, it'll be awesome because I, I really would like to suggest to you that if you have the ability this week, please catch the video version of this episode, episode 31 of Tech Talk Today. Pause it right here if you're listening to the audio feed and go grab the video version because I have to tell you, just seeing this stuff, I think it will work in audio, but just seeing this stuff is so fun. And uh, either from an educational standpoint or a nostalgia standpoint. So anyways, that's my disclaimer for this week's episode. I have worked very hard to try to make it still work for you as an audio show. Uh, and Mumble Room, I hope, uh, I hope, I know most of you are listening on audio. I hope it works for you guys. I think it will, because I, 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 exp- I explicitly left some stuff out that was just way too visual. So guys, buckle up. I'm joined by the Mumble Room, as always, today. Buckle up, because we're going to get super nostalgic. And what I want to do is, before we get into ARPANET, which is really where the internet was born, I want to show you a little bit of what the internet looked like in 93. In 1993, when I really got online, this is what I saw. And there were competing closed up services like CompuServe and AOL and Prodigy, but there was these things called BBSs and this internet that was emerging. And uh, this clip gives you a little idea of what it was like to interact with the internet, just to even get online and start using it. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me today is David Shargell of Aladdin Systems. David, there's a little bit of interest in the Internet these days. There's a new book coming out every week just about on how to use the Internet. You guys have just come out with a new piece of software called Sitcom that makes it easy to log on to Internet and move files up and back and so on. Uh, show us how Sitcom works. Okay. Well, I'm in my address book right now. Mm-hmm. And as you can see, I just typed in my name, my phone number, and my uh, ID and password. And I'm just going to save that address book entry and connect. It's that easy to try to connect to. And what we're, we're logging on right now. We're getting right now onto Netcom, which is an internet dial-up. Okay. Uh, one of the things I did not show you in that uh, particular address book entry was a pop-up menu that has a list of all the services that Sitcom knows how to get onto. For example, the Well or the World, which are other very popular internet dial-up sites. Uh-huh. It also knows how to get onto CompuServe, Genie, MCI Mail, Dow Jones, a lot of commercial services automatically as well as local bulletin boards. What I mean by that is it knows when to type, where to type. Mm -hmm. For example, when the system asks for a password, it knows when to type the password. When the system asks for the name, it knows when to type the name. Okay, so we are just about to log on now, I see. As you can see, it's typing the name, password, and we've just established a connection here. All right, so what can we do? I'm going to ask it to send me a file that I earlier got to my account on Netcom via FTP or File Transfer Protocol, Mm -hmm. and you can see it's now downloading that file via Zmodem. Once that file is here, it's done. I'm going to disconnect. I'm offline now. And it's automatically going to expand that file because it was in a stuff it format, mm-hmm. which is a popular format on the Macintosh. Right. If Connection I was dealing closed. with files from the PC, I can expand zip files, ARC files, or if I'm dealing with Unix, which is what the internet is based on, I can get it Unix compressed files, tar files, mm-hmm. UU code files. All so right. what I'm going to do now, I'm still within Sitcom, and I'm going to view the file that I just got. It's already expanded, and here it is, the Clinton inaugural address. This is the full text that I got to my machine. And there it is. Now, there, of course, because it's the 90s, uh, you might have also caught he mentioned, you know, the Internet's based on Unix. Or actually, he said Internet is based on Unix. Well, that's because Unix was huge uh, where, where, where the Internet was originally born. And I want to tell you a little bit about the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, ARPANET. It started in the late 60s. And over the 70s, it, it grew from like a one connection from the East Coast to the West Coast. And then eventually it became many connections uh, spanning the entire uh, United States uh, from the East Coast to West Coast with connections in the middle and all of that. Right. Well, because the, the point of it was to create a, like a mesh network so that if any one military base, which were what the points were, got blown up by right. a nuke, yep. they would be able to find a way around. And this was like the first like packet network, right? This is where they started using TCP and all these kinds of things was on ARPANET before there was internet. And it's kind of fascinating. Right. I saw the thing there with the packet switch network, the idea was rather than having a direct link from 
point A to point B and point A to point C, you would have connections that at each hop, it could decide which direction to go next. Right. That was a huge innovation. And it's kind of funny because, uh, like Alan said, it was a mesh network designed to sustain a major attack from Russia. It was like a Cold War byproduct, essentially. And this clip goes inside ARPANET. You can see what it looked like in there. And if you watch closely, you'll see a few next stations, too. ARPA was formed by President Eisenhower after Sputnik, its mission to guard the U.S. against technological surprise. Pioneering work on networking technologies resulted in the birth of the Internet. Since the early days, Internet has provided vital communication links in the research community. The Internet is one of the major projects from the late 70s, early 80s. There's been a long tradition of advanced te technology developments at ARPA, starting from the early time-sharing projects through computer graphics into computer networks through personal computing, and more recently to the new world of scalable, high-performance computing. The most recent Internet-inspired development at ARPA is the Enterprise Room. That's Enterprise, as in Starship Enterprise. ARPA's Captain Kirk is Stephen Squires, Director of High Performance Communications Research. Oh, I'd like to welcome you to the bridge of the HPC Enterprise. Behind me, you see a view screen, which is a window into the country's high performance computing and communications program. On the center screen, you can see a map representing all the bitways which are feeding the Washington area to which this facility is connected. Enterprise is the visual embodiment of all the advanced technologies coming out of the government's high performance computing and communications program. And ARPA is not keeping Enterprise to itself. Researchers from around the country pop in via internet connections or in person. It's created a whole new spirit of cooperation among the different agencies in the federal government and throughout the scientific community. People are able to share ideas and develop new things simply based upon their interest. Mosaic is one of those new developments. It's a hypertext interface that lets you browse any information service provided by the Internet. Mosaic was developed by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications with ARPA's support. The thing that makes Mosaic special is that it gives everyone access without there having to be uh, a, a rocket scientist, they don't have to be trained in esoteric uh, computing. Uh, grade school kids can use it. In fact, we're installing it in, in schools because it's a point and click interface. Uh, and that point and click, instead of going through information that's on your personal computer, it's as if there's a million computers on the internet inside your own personal computer. These top-level researchers hope Mosaic lures more average computer users to the internet, especially young people. All over the world, people, local people, ordinary people, are becoming electronic publishers. They're putting up the things that mean something to them and they want to share it with the rest of the world. And what Mosaic does is it provides a window into this incredible cyberspace, this information space that's developing. And it allows you to simply what we call net surf, looking for cool stuff. That's what the kids say they're doing. That's, what, that's the whole mentality of this. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. So they were uh, showing Mosaic there at the end. That was my first web browser, really, was Mosaic. And uh, it first was... time I ever saw a web browser, it was Mosaic. So primitive. So primitive. Wow. Yeah, I didn't see anything until Netscape came out. Well, Netscape was a huge, uh, Net <laughs> especially Netscape 4. Once Netscape 4 yeah. hit, I was all in on Netscape for sure. Mosaic, I was done right. with it. But so much of what Mosaic established uh, continues to be uh, even conventions you'll find in Chrome and all kinds of browsers today. It was a huge you know, innovation. I that that whole clip i was thinking to myself wow this is all stuff we now take for granted oh yeah and everybody knows oh yeah oh yeah big time big 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 time in fact there wasn't even the the, the fact that we would have an http protocol that everybody would use uh, it was absolutely guaranteed to fail according to the analyst because nobody will ever be able to type in a url it is no you cannot expect consumers to be computer scientists they are not going to remember these things and that's why you saw a huge push for like aol keywords and things like that and now you have hashtags and all kinds of stuff and of course search engines and and whatnot but a lot of people believed the web was doomed at at the get-go because of the requirement of needing to know urls kind of funny uh, and then, of course, they developed HTML and all that hypertext and all that kind of stuff. All right, yeah. I, 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 I've got and to. And AOL had keywords instead of domain names. Right, exactly. I've <laughs> got to. Uh, I got to take this to a little bit of a personal route, um, because in my in my reading of uh, yesteryear of the internet, and by the way, a lot of great links in the show notes if you guys want to read more on some of this stuff. 
I came across what I'm calling the proto-podcaster. The, the first podcaster, the, the man who pioneered internet radio. And I didn't even know his name. And essentially, I, have, I, I, I owe a debt of gratitude to this man. So I wanted to spend a minute on the first podcaster. It's, uh, uh, it's really pretty great. His name was Carl Malamud. He founded the first internet-only sta- uh, internet radio station, the internet multicasting service called IMS, in 1993. IMS broadcasted from offices at the National Press Club building in Washington, D.C. It was a nonprofit organization. IMS depended largely on charitable contributions from its audience for its budget. They started broadcasting in 1994, offering several hours of weekly programming, including Geek of the Week, featured interviews with geeks. Uh, They had an audio live feed from Monitor Radio and CBC News. They would grab speeches from the floor uh, of Congress, and then they would replay them, which was a huge upset back in the day because nobody did that on radio. And in fact, some people said, "Well, we need to regulate." It really generated some controversy by rebroadcasting things said on the floor. Uh, IMS later expanded to include online presence for groups ranging from National Press Club to the Red Sage Restaurant. Like many other internet offerings, IMS pushed the limits of public access to government information by offering patent documents and filings with Securities and Exchange Commissions online at no charge. By 1995, IMS expanded its offering to broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It shut down in 1996. Uh, it's not really clear why. The group kind of disbanded, went their own way. And uh, I found a great rare clip of an interview with the first podcaster, and I wanted to play it for you guys, the proto-podcaster. You've been listening to Geek of the Week on Internet Talk Radio. Carl Malamud is Internet Talk Radio. He produces audio data files at this studio in the National Press Club building, then uploads them onto the Internet via the World Wide Web. By sending mail to info at radio.com, you can access his interview program, Geek of the Week, and recordings of the National Press Club luncheon series. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or accessing it on the Global Internet Computer Network. It's one of those ideas that started as a hobby and kind of went nuts. Um, I wrote books about computers. I wrote seven books and I wrote magazine articles and I was looking for a magazine about the Internet and there wasn't one and I wanted to start one. But that's expensive because you have to print paper and you have to mail paper and you have to audit who gets the paper so you can get it back to your advertisers. And I decided, gee, let's do something on the network. Unlike a normal broadcast station which transmits programming on a regular schedule, Melamud's cyber station is a synchronous radio. Our radio is a kind of radio station which you pull up when you want. You come in in the morning, a phone call comes in, you put the radio on hold. You decide you're tired, you put it on hold again. You cut out the part you don't like. You just chop it out. You don't like my restaurant reviews. I love doing restaurant reviews, but you don't like them. You just want to hear the technical meat. You cut them out. This non-linear digital approach to journalism raises both ethical and procedural questions that Malamud looks forward to discussing on the Internet. We need to start seeing the Nina Totenbergs of the world showing up on the Internet. And we also want the individuals of the world being able to publish themselves. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Janelle Stelson. Isn't that an interesting piece? That is, uh, and he kind of he kind of called in a sense too, he, you know. He's when he said uh, I, I forgot uh, the the lady's name he used, but she's a financial radio broadcaster. He said we need the so and sos of the world to get on the internet radio. Well, we really did, didn't we? Because uh, we needed someone to semi legitimize the industry, uh, and I think uh, a lot of us probably think of Leo Laporte in that capacity. But I would argue another individual played a very key role in legitimizing podcasting because he was coming from a big media background, uh, MTV. And I'm talking about Adam Curry. And uh, to move forward with the podcasting genesis, one of my favorite all-time demo fails ever involves Steve Jobs and the introduction of podcasting in the iTunes store. you got to see this. Now, I'm going to give you a warning. There is an F-bomb in this clip, but it's so worth it. This is, this is history in the making. This was Steve Jobs introducing podcasting built into iTunes, which was really when it really went on the big stage for the first time to the entire world at the uh, Wall Street Journal's D conference. I think it was like their third one ever. Great clip. You could, you could try to sell podcasts, but the whole phenomenon is so great, it's free. Okay. And I think what we're going to see is an advertising-supported model emerge just like free radio. Here's another. Adam Curry is uh, one of the guys that invented podcasting. And uh, he has a podcast called The Daily Source. Let me go ahead and subscribe to that. And uh, we can go listen to his latest one. You know, just click on it. What's your daily source code? Show number 180. Something remarkable is happening here. 
Radio is springing free of the regulated gatekeepers who've managed what you can hear since radio was invented. It's jumping into the hands of anyone at all with something or nothing to say. With 16 million dollars worth of airplanes strapped to my ass. Yes. And the next generation radio content in my ears. We don't need no stinking I like to think I'm flying into the future. Podcasting. It's Adam Curry. That's right. It's show number 180, and it's Friday, everybody. Thank God. I've actually had to restart the show three times. My Mac has been acting up like a motherfucker. I don't know what's going on. I think it's uh, something to do with uh, the file system. Okay. Now, uh, how do you... How do you control, say, dirty stuff? I mean, uh, you... we're going to have an explicit flag on these like we do the music so you can know if it's explicit. So I can find it easier. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, good. I, I love that Adam Curry was complaining about a file system on, problem on his Mac because they still use the same freaking file system. It's the same file system! The same one from back yeah, then. Yeah, not much has changed. No, Open it... ZFS on OSX.org. <laughs> there we go. There you go. But how great. There's Steve Jobs, you know, doing an improv demonstration of podcasting. And the one he plays, the first few seconds of the clip, the guy drops an F-bomb about his Mac effing up. I mean, how perfect is that? That's amazing. A great introduction for podcasting. Uh, and while we wrap up, we all know now where we're at now with the Internet. It's been massively disruptive, and it's not even like a douchebag term to call it disruptive. It really has been fundamentally disruptive to society and businesses. And the kind of the poster child business that the Internet has been the most disruptive to is the newspaper industry, right? The print industry. I mean, there's lots, but sort of the poster child is the newspaper. The irony about that particular fact is the newspaper was actually one of the very first industries to ever get online. They were the first to embrace it. They loved it. But they fundamentally misunderstood what it meant. They just saw it as a way to deliver newspapers differently. They didn't get it. But the tragedy is, not only has it steamrolled their business, they were one of the first in it, and they still didn't manage to make it work. So I'm going to wrap it up with that clip. We'll play that in a second. I just want to give a quick plug to our Patreon page over at patreon.com slash today, where you can become a Jupiter Broadcasting investor and keep us going and help us do things like OSCON visits and whatnot. Patreon.com slash today. Any pledge amount helps. It's a monthly fee, so it's not a bunch of money. If you get some value from our shows, we would appreciate your support over at patreon.com slash today. And thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. Now, I'll wrap us up with a look back at the newspaper industry's early embracement of the Internet and how they just thought it was quite swell. And take a look at some of this awesome ancient technology. Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. In fact, both local San Francisco papers are investing a lot of money to try and get to service just like that started. Science editor Steve Newman reports on one person already using the brand new system. 17 stories up in his fashionable North Beach apartment, Richard Halloran is calling a local number that will connect him with a computer in Columbus, Ohio. Meanwhile, across town in this less than fashionable cubbyhole at the San Francisco Examiner, these editors are programming today's copy of the paper into that same Ohio computer. When the telephone connection between these two terminals is made, the newest form of electronic journalism lights up Mr. Halloran's television with just about everything the Examiner prints in its regular edition. That is, with the exception of pictures, ads, and the comics. Eight newspapers around the country are currently in the computer network, and within the next few weeks, three others will join in. This is an experiment. We're trying to figure out what it's going to mean to us as editors and reporters and what it means to the home user. And, and we're not in it to make money. We're uh, probably uh, uh, not going to lose a lot, but we aren't going to make much either. It's Both the Examiner and Chronicle began service within the last two weeks and printed full-page ads about it. Of the estimated two to 3,000 home computer owners in the Bay Area, the Chronicle reports over 500 have responded by sending back coupons. Even though the electronic newspaper isn't as spiffy looking as the ads imply, people using the system are excited about its potential. With this system, we have the option not only of seeing the newspaper on the screen, but also we, optionally we can copy it. So anything we're interested in, we could go back in again and copy it onto paper and save it which I think is, a great, is, is the future of the type of interrogation an individual will give to the newspapers. This is only the first step in newspapers by computer. Engineers now predict the day will come when we get all our newspapers and magazines by home computer, but that's a few years off. So for the moment at least, this fellow isn't worried about being out of a job. Steve Newman, News Center 4.
Well, it takes over two hours to receive the entire text of the newspaper over the phone, and with an hourly use charge of $5, the new telepaper won't be much competition for the 20-cent street edition.